Capcom, go ahead. Flight, you copy? Affirmative, Capcom's coming up. All right. Apollo 7, Houston, Capcom. Voice check, how are you reading? Good morning, Jack. I'm there. Now you're 5 by, Wally. Yeah. Uh, number 2, Capcom, give you a check. How do you read, Wally? Hey, Thomas, uh, I'll drop in and see you about 11 days. Roger, everything looks good here. All Delta P lights out, and it's great. <laughs> okay. See you around, Tom. Roger. It's October 11th, 1968. This is the press vantage point for Pad 34 at Cape Kennedy, and I'm Al Hibbs. I'm surrounded by cameras. Behind me, there are TV trailers and a mock-up of the Apollo spacecraft designed to carry men to the moon before the end of 1969. And that's the reason we're here. In a few minutes, we'll witness the first launching of a manned Apollo spacecraft. Right now, we don't know what the outcome of that launch or this mission will be, but over the next half hour, we'll be bringing you an account from now until the final debriefing, which may be days or weeks from now. Inside the capsule are astronauts Wally Schirra, Don Isley, and Walt Cunningham. It was exactly, almost exactly, six years ago that Wally Schirra piloted his Mercury spacecraft six times around the globe. Then spaceflight was in its infancy. About three years ago, he maneuvered the Gemini 6 into a nose-to-nose -nose rendezvous with Gemini 7, an amazing accomplishment for a space program in its adolescence. And now, this same human being is piloting the test flight of Apollo, a spacecraft designed with some place to go, the moon. A space program and a career coming of age together. Don Isley and Walt Cunningham are both space rookies. They haven't flown before, but perhaps six years from now, they'll be able to look back on an equally illustrious history. We know that the Apollo has never orbited men before, and this is just a shakedown flight to prepare for the later reach to the moon. The powerful Saturn 1B booster is making its debut as a manned launcher. But there have been 14 previous flights of the Saturn 1 family of rockets, and every one of them was successful. That's quite an accomplishment, and a tribute to the genius of Dr. Werner von Braun. It's time to focus our attention on the launch pad. Share with me chapter one in the log of Apollo, Apollo 7. Roger. Flight recorder, record. Flight recorder, record. PDC align. PDC align. IMCC recorders to flight speed. That's T minus 30 seconds. Network flight, all okay with you? That's fine, flight. T minus 21 seconds and come. We have completed our power transfer. Saturn 1B launch cable. Now wait 1.3 million pounds. It's ready to go. Coming up on the 10 second mark. 10. Charlie, booster, I need your status for staging. We're go. Fido, how about you? 
We're going to go for staging, Captain. Apollo 7, you're a go for staging. Roger, we'll go here, Jack. Apollo 7, you're a go for staging. Still good, booster? That's a firm flight. Okay. Good GET clock flight. Thank you. How are you doing? Let's go, Mike. Gimbal's on. Gimbal's on, Roger. Gimbal's good. Mike, good. Seven. Roger. They jettisoned the tower flight. Got us initiate. Stand by. Tower's gone. Okay. Tower's gone, Sato. Roger, right, thank you. Got us this converging flight. Slightly over 10 minutes yeah. after liftoff, Apollo 7's booster cuts off and orbit. The spacecraft stays attached to the S 4B second stage for a couple of revolutions while the crew tests out some procedures necessary on a later flight to the moon. Two hours and 55 minutes after liftoff, they separate from the S-4B. I can see little tiny particles now they rehearse the turnaround and maneuver in which they would pick up their lunar module, or LEM, on a moon landing mission. From here on, the 11-day flight is a succession of engineering tasks, myriad details, matching contingency plans to minor problems that crop up, and proving out the hardware and techniques required to shoot the moon. For example, on the second day, they first fire their service propulsion system, the vital workhorse engine at the back of the service module. With this, they later re-rendezvous with the S-4B, thus simulating a type of space rescue which might be needed in moon orbit. Okay. For the world press, the most exciting news through it all was that Shira and Isley had head colds, and that Shira had determined that the first U.S. telecasts from orbit would wait until the workload settled down. A command decision from the man on the scene, the astronaut. There it is. Hey, we got you. I can see Isley talking there. Hey, Don, turn your head to the right. There you go. Hey, you're picking up. I can read it now. Just a minute. It says, from that uh, lovely Apollo something. You guys should write Apollo it. Apollo room. High, high atop, atop everything. Something. High atop everything. Looks good. Tom, you can look at it better on your TV. It's more accurate on your little tube. Channel 51. Right now, we're going to let the astronauts give us their own guided tour of the orbit, as they did at the LBJ Ranch on November 2nd. We'd like to tell you about our flight the easy way. The first thing I'd like to do is to project some of the film that was taken with the spacecraft camera. We had a 16 millimeter camera on board. One of our first concerns was that we had had problems with other crews in extravehicular activity, or EVA. In this case, we were within a large spacecraft where we could move, and we were concerned somewhat about IVA, or intravehicular activity. As a result, we carried extra film with us, and it was quite surprising. IVA was a delight. It was very pleasant and a very easy environment for man to live in, to adapt to immediately. Um, well, what would you describe this? You were the photographer here. These are the pictures that we took uh, after the S-4B separation and turnaround. And Wally's flying the spacecraft back in uh, very gently, ever so gently, I should say. And we started taking uh, films from, uh, oh, I guess it must have been about 100 feet away and bringing it right on in. I believe the closest pictures we got were something like about 25 feet. We're looking at one of the deployed panels on the slaw, and I believe the one that doesn't quite show up down the lower right-hand corner is the one that uh, apparently came open and then bounced back part way to about 20 degrees opening. Right now we're passing across the... Uh, we, we, we hit the states yet here, Wally? Yes, we're just coming up on the Gulf Coast. Okay, we're coming up along the uh, Gulf Coast of the uh, United States along through here. We took some very interesting stills of the S-4B above each of the major Gulf cities. You're looking down along the Gulf Coast there on the left, and we'll have, uh, there's Apalachicola, I believe. 
It trails right on across uh, Florida, and we had a very beautiful sight that we all were amazed at looking down at the S4B backgrounded by the Cape, and here comes the Cape right over the top. There's where it all began, right there. It's quite surprising, but each of us that come back say that this must be a blue planet because of the uh, bright blues of the ocean and the slight blue haze. Uh, this is the uh, documentary proof that we actually saw the S4B twice. You'll notice that the <laughs> slot panels are all deployed, and it's uh, rotating at a, a fairly healthy clip, and it didn't seem to be having any special orientation. It was uh, rotating about all three axes. I'd like to take over here. This is Don's little rat nest where he kept his food compartment. <laughs> <laughs> I found a little crack above the, uh, the optic stoic panel. There you see where we had our toothbrushes and toothpaste and also our uh, communications helmets when we weren't using them. There's Wally's stowage bag with a red towel sticking out of it. And there's mine with a helmet mounted below it. These were things were just pinned to the wall with snaps. So we're doing a little sightseeing here and uh, this is a an example of how easy it is to move around in zero-g. You'll notice you're moving very slowly. It turns out that you can adjust quite readily to the environment. And uh, for several days up there, we were all commenting on how amazed we were that anybody could ever feel bad in, in the environment. It's just uh, the most relaxing sensation you've ever had. <laughs> the interesting thing to note is we started the sequence. You must have observed there was no one there. Uh, as we continue the sequence, you'll note that Walt is lying down there, Don is getting dressed and attaching his communications harness, and that I'm over in this lower corner. And after we got back and saw this film, we began to realize that someone else must have been holding the camera. <laughs> It seems the television films, uh, that caused some consternation too, and there was no one in the couches. There, there seems to be a tendency of, of uh, the ground, I think, to believe that uh, unless somebody is sitting there, you know, really flying all the time, it's not going to stay up, but it, it's obviously not the case. Don is at the lower equipment bay, uh, as he is typically shown in these films, eating something, uh, <laughs> working at the sextant for an alignment. And rather interestingly enough, we had attachment points to Velcro, which is a sticky material at the base of the spacecraft, to hold us in position. You'll notice Don isn't even using it. He is held in position basically by minor soft handholds. Here's a good example. Don's sitting here, he's fixing a meal and he's unpacking it right now, and uh, he wants to leave something temporarily in the air. That's where he leaves it. You know, it's also interesting though that I'm sitting sideways, 90 degrees to what you'd normally think of being the normal way, but that doesn't seem to worry you up there. There isn't really any up or down. <laughs> no one seems to care whether you're uh, <coughs> upside down or not. Turns out you really need very little in the way of attachments or uh, places to hold you. <laughs> Here's Wally doing a demonstration of uh, zero-g uh, maneuverability. And <laughs> Well, you, ought to see, you ought to see him come back. He's just as graceful as you ever saw anybody. Gazelle <laughs> boy Shirai. <laughs> this is really out of character for me, so they're giving me a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> this next scene is not out of character for Wally, though. Here we go. <laughs> well, Walt is the gymnast of the group, and he had to have his opportunity. The important thing is, you may note that we're having fun and games. The antics really are to demonstrate that we were very comfortable and did not feel that we were in an awkward environment. Notice the tremendous number of switches and circuit breakers we have, over 700. Not one was inadvertently actuated throughout the whole flight. Walt's preparing some orange juice here. There's the water gun they used to put the water in the bag. He's in the process now of mixing it up. <laughs> <laughs> so this was to illustrate uh, what gas bubbles do when you uh, spin something. They don't actually coalesce into one large bubble, but they do concentrate in the center of the bag due to centrifugal force. By spinning it up, we found that uh, the little small gas bubbles would coalesce in the center. Uh, here I'm showing a plastic bag of coffee. This was our great high point after the rendezvous to have a plastic bag of coffee. Uh, notice the bubbles as they move. And this is quite interesting to us. We've had all sorts of experiments to determine how bubbles react in the weightless environment. And we'll spin this particular bag as well. And you'll see the bubbles concentrating right in the geometric center. 
Now here we have a sequence of Walt putting on this rather large lumpy suit, which became a rather annoying thing to us. And it was very uncomfortable to wear after the flight coveralls. And you notice the suit retains its <laughs> position somewhat. And it does sort of give you trouble fighting it. The suit weighs about 55 pounds on the surface of the earth. As you can see, Walt is becoming properly dressed for the occasion. I'm also getting worried. <laughs> <laughs> now, we had fun with this. This film was originally shot at six frames a second, which gives us a Keystone cop routine. <laughs> we decided Walt should get out, and we reversed the film. <laughs> You can guess what his problem was, but we'll just leave that up in the air. <laughs> now here we demonstrate the capability of handling our equipment, and we bring the camera to a close. Now this particular shot is a shot of the number one window, as I described it on my side, where some of the external debris from water dumps <coughs> and urine dumps have collected on the outer pane. The demonstration we're trying to show to you here is that even as clear as these windows are, external objects that are with us in Earth orbit may collect on the spacecraft. Uh, from every flight, we've had reports of objects that seem to <coughs> come off the uh, exterior of the spacecraft, and this is what we've seen, finally, on the window itself. Well, this particular shot, I think we're about 25 feet away. Now, after a rather great amount of work that was done to accomplish this rendezvous, Don Isley got us in the position where I could decelerate and come back and see the booster again. This is the S-4B as we see it after the rendezvous was completed. Now, Walt, I think you should describe this one. You were nearer to it. This is the picture, one of the very best we took, of uh, Hurricane Gladys. It was sitting in the Gulf of Mexico during the flight. And it, uh, I guess it was the past before this, or I guess maybe the day before, that Wally gave a mark over the hurricane itself, and we became a weather satellite. And this pass was uh, just an exceptional one to be able to get a picture of the entire hurricane. Now, as we are world travelers, I thought we might take you around the world a little bit. And here you can see the complete tracing of the Suez Canal, all the way up to Port Said, the Gaza Strip, and Israel, and the Republic of Egypt. I think it's rather interesting to note, uh, particularly in our president's remarks and the work he has done to make our space program peaceful, that with the opportunities we had to fly between the latitudes of 31 North and 31 South, the world was very peaceful and very attractive to us. And I think we can show you that with some of these other slides. Here we are over the Ganges River of India and the Himalayas as it were there a long time before Gordon Cooper went over. But Gordon Cooper is the one that had pictures of Himalayas from every different aspect, both on his Mercury and Gemini flights. And Mount Everest is up in this area, and the next one I think will show you the fantastic elevations of the Himalayas. It's one of the uh, dominant scenes for the first several days of the flight, as you always seem to have good daylight right over the Himalayas. And the picture you have right here, for example, there's the 12 tallest peaks in the world are all in that picture. And here is a picture of the Tibetan area. You notice the uh, snow line, that's about 18,000 feet. And the clarity of this is due to the fact that there's very little atmosphere from this surface up to where we are. And where our spacecraft started, as uh, shown in this slide, we are off the west coast, and you can find that we have the California area, right? Los Angeles, Palm Springs, Lake Tahoe, Las Vegas. And uh, you can see just a little bit of the smog that seemed to permeate the air over the Los Angeles area. and. Fortunately, we didn't have to take any of that with us in the spacecraft. Here we have Mobile Bay, Mobile itself, Berkeley Air Force Base. Another generator of smoke is Birmingham. I would like to make note of the fact that from this, you can see smoke in various areas coming through. And it shows what man can do to a beautiful climate by polluting the atmosphere. This is our classic victory at sea picture of Florida. I think, Walt, you might describe how this one was taken. <laughs> <laughs> it shows there's no substitute for experience. We, were, uh, we just departed the Houston area, running across the Gulf Coast, and 
it was kind of dim light, it was towards the end, and we were running out of film, and I was being kind of tight with it. And, well, I says, hey, there's a good picture, take it. And I says, oh, the light's no good. He says, shoot it. He says, they really go for that sunshine coming off the water. <laughs> <laughs> so all I can say is he was 100% right. Next time I saw it was on the front page of uh, Florida paper. Two, one. On October 22nd, 259 hours and 39 minutes after liftoff, the service propulsion system performs retrofire and the faithful okay, service module the separates from the command module bearing the crew. Apollo 7 re-enters across the southern United States, a glowing fireball. Its parachutes carry it to the primary recovery area in the ocean east of Florida. It comes to rest floating apex down in the condition known as stable two. The crew uprights it with special flotation bags that are carried just for that purpose. This is the actual Apollo 7 recovery, a basket ride to the waiting helicopter and then to the carrier Essex for a hero's welcome. That was seven decimal five. When word of the safe recovery gets back to Houston, the traditional cigars turn mission control into a smoke-filled room. Captain Sherrar, Colonel Isley, and Mr. Cunningham, your flight in the new Apollo spacecraft was one of the most successful space missions that's ever been undertaken. By this country or by any other country. And we just don't see how you could have done any better. I am told that you accomplished as many mission objectives, 56 of them, in this one flight as were accomplished in the first five manned flights of the Gemini spacecraft. You logged the most man hours ever in a single flight mission, more than 780 hours. This incidentally is more man hours than have been logged in all the Soviet man flights to date. They still lead us only in woman hours in space. <laughs> For nearly 11 days, much longer than is required to go to the moon and back, you operated this complex new spacecraft without a failure in any major system. In short, you prove beyond doubt that you were flying the world's most advanced and most versatile manned space vehicle. And I want to pay tribute here too to our private enterprise system and the industry that made that possible, as well as the scientists who provided that great leadership. You prove that the United States today leads in space accomplishments. This is not important as either a game or a contest. But it is important because the United States of America must be first in technology if it is to continue its position in the world. We're in the office of Dr. Homer Newell, Associate Administrator of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Does the Apollo experience open up any new avenues of technological spin-off from the space activities into other kinds of technological activities? Yes, I think it does. And in fact, although we often use the shorthand of saying we're going to get men to the moon and land them and bring them back safely as the objective of the Apollo program, in reality, the long-range objective is to stimulate the development of technology. And if you think a bit about it, you see that you have to solve problems in structures, in energy use, batteries, power supplies, the handling of information, the protection of men, the development of new environments under which to operate. You name the discipline, and it's almost certain that it has to be tackled at its very frontier in the Apollo program. And this just infuses into our ability to do other things on Earth. And I should emphasize in concluding that the ability to manage large-scale 
projects like this is going to be important in tackling problems of pollution, transportation, our cities, the food problem, and so on. Do you think the medical experiences of the astronauts will help us solve the common cold problem? Well, it certainly has highlighted the need for some attention to the problem. Thank you very much, Dr. Newell. It's my pleasure. It's November 13th, 1968, and this is our last entry in the log of Apollo 7. It's about one month after liftoff, and this is the Apollo 7 command module. It's back now at its birthplace, the Space Division of North American Rockwell at Downey, California. And the men who built it are now performing an autopsy. Last night, they removed the main heat shield, the aft heat shield down here that protected the structure against the temperature of reentry. And the structure down here has now been exposed. You can see there's some corrosion here. That's, that's from the ocean at the end of the ride. The Apollo has suffered a sea change. The heat shield itself has been moved to another position for examination. The outside surface, of course, is black and charred. It uh, had a temperature of more than 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Looks a bit like a mistake on my barbecue. As a matter of fact, in places, this structure is no thicker than a good hunk of sirloin. But the internal structure is still essentially intact. Here on the spacecraft, this Mylar covering is the original. It rode all the way through the mission, all the way down through reentry. And the nozzles of the attitude control jets are in almost such perfect condition. Well, in principle, they could be used again. Inside the spacecraft, quite a bit of the equipment has been removed, but you can still see the display panel in the Cunningham position. And of course, the findings from all of this are still being sifted. But as of yesterday, NASA announced that on the basis of the spectacular success of Apollo 7 and together with the confidence in the overall Apollo system, it would be possible now for the next mission, that's Apollo 8, to plan as its ultimate goal having three Americans in orbit around the moon on Christmas. And considering that this is only the second manned flight of Apollo, that's an impressive vote of confidence. Since we filmed the first entry in this log, the Earth has rotated 33 times on its axis, although Shira and his crew saw roughly 165 orbital sunrises and sunsets, so that puts them well ahead of the rest of us. The wheel of American politics has turned its Republican face to the world. The Soviet Union has stepped up its space program, which indicates that the moon race may yet hold a few surprises. And oh yes, Jackie and Onassis captured the headlines for a few days. There's been change, progress, movement, now. And it's all symbolized by this, well, perhaps odd looking, but supremely efficient mechanism. So ready or not, moon, here we come. Now there's just one last request I'd like to make of you. If you recall, when Shira and his companions were giving their orbital telecast, they held up a little card like this, and following it, bags and bags of mail poured into Houston. Well, we hope to continue this filmed log of the Apollo program all the way through the Apollo program, but we need your comments and your encouragement to make it possible. So please, write to me tonight and tell me what you like about the program, and if you must, you can tell me what you didn't like about the program, because only with your letters can we bring Apollo into your home on public television. A little closer, Wally. To keep those cards coming. Cards and letters coming in. Coming in, folks. It's loud and clear. Okay, let's take a look and see how New Orleans is this morning. Don't fall over there, Don.